Hello all, welcome to this uh, advanced in post computer design course. Uh, we are in the module 9. We are talking about uh, serviceability, how to calculate uh, deflection crack width, and also we'll be focusing on bond. In this part of the module, we are going to discuss about why we need to be careful about cracking and how to estimate the crack widths. And uh, we will also see how the code provisions are uh, dealing with the crack width calculations. The expected learning outcomes or the student should be able to differentiate the different types of cracks in different members, right? And then we, she, she or she should be able to state the effect of crack width on structural member. And what are the factors that are going to influence the crack width? I think that we will talk about and the student should be able to explain. And then we will uh, uh, deal with how to calculate the crack width for different uh, members using a couple of examples. Right, so in the we talked about uh, uh, deflection, uh, as we have discussed, uh, in the limit state of serviceability, we will have two major things that we are focusing on. One is the deflection, that includes estimation of short-term deflection, long-term deflection, and IS code provisions that we discussed in the last part of the module. In this module, we are going to focus on crack width, and particularly, how to estimate the crack width using IS 456 code provisions. Right. So you know that we have different types of cracks, and the cracks are usually caused by tensile stresses due to load, moment, and shear, like this. Right. Sometimes it's not only the load effect, uh, it causes corrosion, also, we have discussed in detail, that also causes a cracking because of the formation of rust products which occupy a larger volume and it is going to put some surrounding uh, cut, uh, pressure on the surrounding concrete in that process you will have cracking and spot now if you see here the members can be subjected to direct tension so you may have you know cracks like this they may be mostly vertical right and uh, if it is uh, this is for plain concrete right this is for plain concrete and this is for a reinforced concrete, right? So, if you see here, uh, you can have cracks like this, you know, on multiple directions because of the presence of reinforcement that is going to, in fact, the reinforcement in this case, this is the reinforcement that is going to help us in arresting this crack. The reinforcement should be perpendicular to the direction of the crack to arrest its arrest its propagation. So. In fact, this vertical bars will not be effective in this uh, case, and it will be the horizontal bars that are going to be effective in arresting this crack. Right? Similarly, we may have uh, beams subjected to pure bending, or uh, column members will be subjected to combinations of bending shear and uh, axial uh, compression. So you can have different types of crack formation, but when you have bending and compression, usually the crack angles are pretty much vertical if you have very high compression uh, depending upon the magnitude and the, the uh, level of shear that you have crack directions may change but predominantly they will remain vertical with respect to the horizontal axis right so now we can also have shear we discussed in depth uh, during the shear chapter the crack that forms in the web usually the shear crack forms in the web and then it propagates to the bottom and the top and they are pretty much, if you look at close to the neutral axis of the location or the CG of the section, they are pretty much uh, remains 45 degree. And if you have pre-stress, then you can have a crack angle will change. So that we discussed uh, about uh, using more circle in the chapter on shear. Now in flexure shear cracks are usually the cracks that forms in flexure, which are predominantly vertical cracks. Then they convert itself like this. Okay. So those kind of cracks are called as fluctuation because the fluctual crack forms first and then it converts itself into a shear crack, right? And uh, you can also have for thin uh, web members, you can have a pure diagonal web shear crack only, right? Like this also crack formation now. This is for web shear crack. So these cracks do not have fluctuated crack. The crack starts it in the neutral axis and then uh, it goes down and up. 
right so then you can have torsion crack we discussed this in the chapter on torsion right so the torsion crack is going to spiral around on all the faces okay so that is the reason we also looked at it you will have only one leg of stirrup that will be effective in each face right even if you put multiple uh, stirrup select they are not going to be effective in resisting the torsion because at uh, one the crack whatever that is there on the this crack angle is changing on each face it is will be effectively you will have only the outer legs of the uh, stirrup that will be effective in controlling this crack width in addition to that we have also uh, seen that the crack angle is going to keep uh, changing and we need to use closed stirrups okay for torsion because you are going to have cracking in all the four faces sometimes when you have concentrated load because of this you can have this kind of a splitting crack okay because of the high concentration and now the system wants to expand in the lateral direction that can create this kind of a splitting crack so these are the different types of structural crack that you usually encounter in addition to that you can also have bond cracks like this if your bond between the bar and the surrounding concrete is not good enough then you will have interfacial uh, slipping that is happening that will lead to these kind of cracks these are called as bond cracks okay so they will go like this around the aggregate and sometimes it will be like this horizontal if you see this kind of crack pattern that means the interfacial shear transfer between the reinforcement crack is not happening properly and these type of cracks we call them as bond cracks and you can also have shrinkage induced crack which is very very important when you have a large surface area when you have thin members with large surface area uh, to volume then you will have uh, shrinkage crack and if as we have discussed in uh, chapter on deflection if uh, shrinkage is happening uniformly there is no problem but if you have a differential shrinkage then you will have cracking like this so especially for example this kind of a wall thin wall system which is restrained by heavy members at the two ends the wall uh, cannot shrink uniformly you will have some differential shrinkage then you will see this kind of uniformly distributed cracks that are pretty much coming from restrained shrinkage then you you may also have cracks due to uh, excessive uh, release of heat during the hydration process uh, these kind of cracks will be like this randomly spaced cracks like this when you have a large exposed area and then when you are using high early strength cement then if the heat of hydration is very high then you can end up with these kind of cracks these are not related to structural especially the shrinkage crack and the crack that is coming from heat of hydration so we need to appropriately design your mix design to reduce your shrinkage cracks and the cracks that are coming from heat of hydration right in addition to that uh, you can also have this plastic uh, slumping crack so uh, we know that when you have a reinforcement like this okay there will be a tendency of the concrete to actually settle on the sideways then you create this kind of a, a notch or a kind of a crack which runs along the uh, the bar that you are considering this type of crack is called as plastic slump crack because the material tends to settle sideways around the rebar so when the concrete is very wet when it is in the plastic stage there is a tendency for the concrete which is around the bar to settle sideways this creates this plastic slumping crack then you can also have this map kind of cracking due to shrinkage or due to asr that we discussed in durability chapter where due to alkali silica reaction then corrosion corrosion we have discussed when iron converts into iron oxides different forms the volume of the rust is much higher so it is going to put pressure on the surrounding concrete then you are going to have this kind of cracks okay so these are effect of cracks then again this we discuss splitting crack due to bond if the interfacial bond is not proper then you will have this kind of crack these are called as bond cracks so these are the different types of cracks now why should we really concerned about cracks and crack widths in particular so let's talk about that and how the code is giving maximum limit under service loads what are the maximum limits that we should limit the crack widths to so if you look at class 35.32 then you have a crack 
or limited to 0.3 mm for mild exposure is typically typical interiors and it is limited to 0.2 mm for moderate exposure especially when you have let's say foundation elements that are in contact with soil or groundwater you have to limit your crack width to 0.2 mm and 0.1 mm for severe and very severe exposure right so the categories of exposure which we have discussed in the durability chapter so you can look at the definitions right so these are the limits so maximum crack width as per is 426 is 0.3 mm that is for mild exposure and for severe and very severe you have to limit it to 0.1 mm but if you can uh, uh, in fact uh, if you can design a crack free system then your durability performance will be much better and one way of doing that is basically putting the concrete under pre stress okay so that is a separate course in itself you can look at it when the crack widths are very very small it is believed that the crack less than 0.2 mm tends to heal autogenously okay so the the crack can can close by formation of additional calcium silicate hydride gels that can occupy that so it, it will not let uh, seepage or other things okay but as the water percolates to this crack it dissolves the calcium salts in the cement and it prevents the subsequent leakage so if you are able to limit it to 0.2 0.1 mm then uh, the performance will not be hampered now why should we control the crack okay so first of all you know nobody would like to see large cracks on their uh, structural even though we are structural engineers we know that cracks are permitted in design uh, but a person who is not well versed with the uh, behavior of concrete system if they see the cracks they may get psychological early they will have fear that the element may collapse at any point of time and then first is the appearance uh, so you know in a smooth surface you know the crack width has become more than 0.25 to 0.3 mm it can create issues and it will become a concern for public who are using it and leakage especially for liquid retaining structures if crack widths are large then it can lead to leakage and further corrosion and other performance related issues so that we need to be careful then second thing is the moment cracks are there then you are creating a passages for chlorides oxygen and uh, moisture to enter and reach the level of steel and it can basically damage that protective uh, protective layer that forms okay then it can basically expedite the corrosion process so it can speed up the occurrence of, uh, occurrence of corrosion okay so we have talked talked about the corrosion and other things in durability chapter so again for these reasons we need to control the crack widths Uh, we have discussed this when the steel oxidizes to rust like this okay when you have ingress of this corrosive species into porous concrete like see this could be chloride this could be oxygen this could be moisture right so when it reaches the level of steel then electrochemical cell is formed and then uh, corrosion starts okay you form anodes and cathodes then you iron oxides form this iron oxide volume is 7 to 8 times larger than iron particle itself so you get voluminous corrosion products then that is going to put pressure on the surrounding concrete then you get these cracking and spalling like this okay so that is the reason again concrete uh, another way discussed in durability chapter is by making the microstructure dense by using pozzolanic materials we discussed about that what are the benefits of that right so you have to properly design your mix but then even if you do that if you are allowing crack widths to happen or cracks to happen under service loads then you are creating the passage and in reinforced concrete design again cracks are allowed to have allowed to be there but only we limit the crack width depending upon the exposure condition right so so from corrosion point of view but i think we need to have crack free elements okay so especially chlorides and other corrosive substances they can present and when the relative humidity is more than 60 percentage again corrosion will occur and we know that when you have a high ambient temperature it is going to accelerate the chemical reaction so more corrosion product can form faster and then when you have wetting and drying cycle again you have uh, crack formation due to corrosion sometimes you can also have stray electrical currents occurring in the bar that can uh, lead to formation of uh, electrochemical cell and then it can lead to corrosion so these are the reasons uh, why corrosion will occur again corrosion can be prevented if you make the concrete non porous or less porous 
and another way is to due to loads we need to make sure that the crack widths are going to be limited in fact uh, if you can design everything to be remaining in compression that is the best okay now let us look at what are the influencing factors for crack width okay so as we have seen due to load effects higher the tension stress in the rebar that means the surrounding concrete is going to be in larger uh, tensile stress then you are going to have cracks then thickness of the concrete cover okay again that also plays a role from durability point of view and fire resistance point of view we put larger cover okay but uh, again putting too much of cover is also not good the reason is if you have larger cover and you put a reinforcement the crack has to open that much before the steer, the car the the rebar can actually arrest the propagation of the crack so because the rebar is at a, a higher depth from the surface that means the crack width has to open larger before it is being intercepted by the uh, rebar so that is also not good though it may be good from uh, fire resistance point of view to put more cover uh, from durability point of view uh, also is good but we should your cover should not crack so again thickness of the concrete cover is also plays a role and uh, a diameter smaller diameter and lesser spacing of the bars in fact is very helpful in uh, preventing larger cracks okay you can have a multiple number of cracks of smaller width than having uh, fewer numbers of larger crack widths so it also depends upon type of the member and under service loads what are the location of neutral axis under service loads and bond strength uh, if bond strength is high and the tensile strength is high then the crack width is expected to be less and let's look at now what are the key factors okay so when we calculate the crack width of course the tensile stress in the bar means you know you will also have mean tensile strength we will talk about what is a mean tensile strength mean tensile strain in the neighboring reinforcement okay so uh, in uh, reinforced concrete uh, flexural members we know that the cracks are not going to form even though your bending moment may be uniform your crack need not form on all the locations cracks will form only at certain locations so between the cracks still the concrete will offer some contributions to tensile resistance so mm -hmm. that is the reason we cannot use cracked strain of steel in calculations of crack width because between the cracks now the concrete is also helping in low resistance in tension by contributing in tension so we have to calculate mean tensile strain okay so you have to take an average strain okay between the cracked locations and the uncracked location in some ways then that should be used in calculation of your crack width okay we will talk about that how to calculate that epsilon sm now it also depends upon what is the distance the maximum distance to the nearest longitudinal bar that runs perpendicular to the crack okay so we will talk about it for example you can have bars at different locations okay now what is the distance to the nearest longitudinal crack from the outer surface we have to calculate We will show through example what is this ACR that we are talking. About. Okay, so then again the next one is in case of flexural crack, it is the distance to the neutral axis location. So we know that if the depth of the neutral axis is very small, if it's very close to the compression phase, then you know that you have a large tensile zone. And then you will expect it to have larger crack. So these are the three important factors that will influence. how much crack width that you are going to have so one is the epsilon sm the mean tensile strain and another one is the distance from the outer surface to the nearest longitudinal bar that runs perpendicular to the crack and then the distance to the neutral axis location so we will talk about now how to control the crack width okay of course if i am able to limit all these three factors key factors then i will have lesser crack width so how to do that so one way is to limiting the tensile stress in the steel so using crack section analysis okay and uh, you have under service loads we want to make sure that the stress in the steel in tension is going to be less so definitely that means uh, concrete would not have exceeded much higher strains so your strains in the concrete surrounding concrete is also going to be less then you will have lesser crack width 
and minimizing the spacing of the rebars okay again as we have discussed for a particular area it is always better to have small diameter bar and large numbers than large diameter and fewer numbers okay because anyway the weight of the steel is given by the area for a particular area you can always choose less a diameter bar from crack control point of view and again provide bars as close as possible to the concrete surface in the tension zone including the side face reinforcement in dp so uh, you can see that you make sure that minimum spacing is there so that aggregates can flow through but if your minimum require minimum spacing requirements are taken care then it is always better to put bars close to each other so that in the event of crack formation the rebar can quickly arrest this crack propagation right now let us look at this so we talked about acr epsilon n a lot of factors so let's see uh, now this crack wet calculation setup so for a particular section that what we are considering the overall effective depth if i am taking it as d then effective depth i am taking it as small d right so in the neutral axis let's say when you do a crack section analysis you know how to find neutral axis let's say the neutral axis is at a distance of x from the compression phase and then let's say these are the points where the potential crack could form so basically this p1 and p2 and this anyway p1 and p2 are same whether you are taking on the left or right you can also sometimes crack forming somewhat below also depending upon what is this distance so we will talk about what are those distances now a prime is the distance of the point where you are calculating the crack width from the compression phase so that's why for p3 here it is from here compression phase we are measuring till here which is a prime for p1 and p2 what would be a prime it will be equal to d because uh, this a prime and d will become same so now let us look at what is acr1 and acr3 and acr2 for point 1 if you look at it right so point 1 let's say this is the point that we are talking about now what is acr we looked at it distance from the outer surface to the maximum distance from the outer surface to the rebar so from a point 1 i am calculating this would be the distance acr right similarly what is acr2 this is the distance so nearest bar right so if you look at it this is the distance that we have acr2 similarly what is acr3 from this point to the nearest bar which is this so you take this distance which is acr3 right so you can have crack forming in all the three locations but p1 and p2 is expected to be high if p3 is very close somewhere here then you can say that at this location also initially crack can form but now p3 is little higher on the up and if your side cover is also when it is very high then you can have crack forming at p3 also but most of the time you will have crack forming in either at p1 or p2 so we need to check for that so now what is c minimum c minimum is the minimum cover to this longitudinal bar okay so this is the clear cover minimum clear cover to the longitudinal bar now what is dc dc is your effective cover effective cover means clear cover plus half the diameter of the bar that you are using right now let's look at this okay let's say look at a slab in this case okay now how to calculate this acr distance okay we know the total spacing using pythagoras theorem we can calculate the spacing so i need the clear spacing from the outer surface of the bar to the point what we are calculating. so this is the distance that we are calculating but now we know from this distance the middle to this is basically we can calculate from pythagoras theorem as let's say this is your s by 2 right now what would be uh, this distance okay the clear cover dc is known this distance dc is known now what is acr using your pythagoras theorem we can calculate that. okay but i need acr not to the center line of the bar i need it from here to here only okay from the outside surface only. so i have to subtract half of the diameter of the bar so that's what we do so basically acr is s by 2 whole square plus dc square minus db by 2 what is db db is this diameter of the bar so half of the diameter we need to because acr is a clear distance from the outer surface to the outer edge of the bar 
Okay, so that's why we are subtracting this half of the diameter. Now, once you calculated ACR, people have seen that the crack width is proportional to the ACR. Higher the ACR, higher will be the crack width and the epsilon m, the mean tensile strain that you are having it in the rebar. And now, uh, people have done a lot of testing and they have come up with constants which can give correlate with the experimental measurements. Now, that constant depends upon how good your bar is having bond with the concrete. Now, you know, we have different types of bars, smooth bar, deformed bars and so on, right? If I am using smooth bar, obviously, the bond is not going to be high. But if I am using a deformed bar with lux okay, or ribs, then you are going to have good mechanical interlock and your bond is going to be better. So, higher the bond, higher will be the constant. So, that's what we have. So, you can see, sir. Uh, yeah, a bond, but then for deformed bar, then the crack width is expected to be less because the bond is better. So that is why this constant is going to be less for deformed bars and high for plane bars. Okay, so these are the constants. So crack width is proportional to the ACR, which is the distance from the outer surface to the outer edge of the rebar. Okay, and it is proportional to the mean tensile strain of the rebar. Okay, now what is mean tensile strain? We'll discuss about it. And then uh, through experimental measurement, people have calibrated this crack width to be proportional to the how good your bar is having bond. Better the bond, lesser will be the crack width. So that is why for deformed bars, you have a lower value of 3.3 and a higher value of 4 for plane bars where you tend to have lower bond strength. Okay. So again, epsilon m is average strain at the considered, uh, average steel strain at the considered level. Okay. So now let us look at how the IS 456. This is the principle with which the crack width can be calculated. Now, exactly how does IS 456 tells? Okay. IS 456 tells, okay, as we have said, it is ACR multiplied by epsilon m. In addition to that, there is also another factor that comes. Okay. So, which is 1 plus 2 into ACR minus C minimum by D minus x. Now, this P1, P2, P3 are not at the level of the steel. Okay. So, you calculate this epsilon m at the level of steel but i need to when i when i when when the point i am considering even it is going to be below the rebar on the tension zone then that location my strain tensile strain is going to be larger right because when you look at the neutral axis depth so you know that so let's say this is my strain so here if this is your strain at this location let's say epsilon m uh, is going to be higher than what I am going to have at the level of steel. Let's say epsilon m1, this is epsilon m2. So epsilon m1 uh, is expected to be smaller than your epsilon m2. So that is what we say. So if somehow if I can calculate my mean strain, then I have to extrapolate it to the point that I am considering. For example, what is A prime? We have discussed A prime for P1, P2 is equal to D. So then this D minus X by D minus small D minus X. And anyway, capital D is higher than small D. So in a way that what we are doing is whatever the strain on the level of the rebar, we are extrapolating it to the point where we are calculating the crack width. So basically this factor A prime minus X by D minus X, it relates the strain at the level of crack location where you are depending upon where you are calculating. For example, in P3, you see A prime will be less. And then I have to take lesser strain. So that's what it is, right? So, so IS code does not permit the application of crack width to situations where the tensile stress in the steel exceeds 0.8 FI. That means when the stress in the steel is getting close to that of 0.8 FI or 80% of the yield stress are going to be higher, and then the steel is almost going to yield. That means your neutral axis would have gone to the top and your crack width will be very high. And these equations are calibrated for service loads. Okay. In service loads, the stresses in the steel is expected to be around 40, 50, 60 percentage of your yield strength, not more than that. Right. So that is the reason the code is saying that when the stress levels in the steel is exceeding 0.8 FI, you cannot use these equations. But again, what is that crack width is proportional to? It is proportional to ACR. And it is proportional to epsilon m, the mean tensile strain in the rebar. Then you extrapolate it to the location 
by some empirical constant which basically extrapolates the strain at the point where we are doing the calculation of the crack depth right right so now let's look at how to do this epsilon m how to calculate this epsilon m okay there we are going to do two analysis one is a cracked section analysis another one is an uncracked section analysis right and then uh, we know cracked section analysis because even if you have a pure bending region not all the locations in the pure bending regions are going to be cracked so there is going to be a concrete between the cracks that is going to help in uh, tensile resistance it is going to offer some resistance to the applied uh, tension so whatever the strain that we are calculating at the cracked so using cracked section has to be reduced because then it will lead to larger estimation of crack width which is also not good at the same time i need to recognize that concrete between the cracks is going to contribute in tension so how to estimate that so i do crack section analysis i find the strain and then i reduce that by some magnitude okay now let us see how do we do that so at crack to section now again when you do crack section uh, we can calculate the strain okay by assuming that the area below the neutral axis is going to be uh, not there and you convert the steel area into an equivalent concrete area using modular ratio and then when you equate the areas then you can calculate your neutral axis and you can calculate your strain epsilon one right which we, which uh, which is relatively straightforward and then epsilon one depending upon whether you are doing it p1 and p2 or p3 then this is your extrapolation factor and if it is going to be at the soffit this is going to be higher than what you are going to get at the level of steel which we have seen now this is your cracked section now now what as we discussed this epsilon one will be higher estimate that has to be reduced to somehow by some magnitude which we are calling that as epsilon two because that is the thing the concrete between the cracks is going to contribute in tension so this phenomena is also called as tension stiffening okay that has to be accounted and the epsilon one has to be reduced by some magnitude epsilon 2 now what is that magnitude epsilon 2 that we need to consider so what we are going to say is between the cracks if i take the section i am going to say that the stress in the concrete at the level steel level is i am going to take that as 0.55 megapascal this come from your british code okay this comes from your british code so uh, 0.55 megapascal we are taking okay so what they are saying is okay if i take that at the level of steel 0.55 megapascal is what maximum uh, the concrete can take so then how much would be the equivalent strain in the level of steel that i am going to subtract so let's see how do we do that so what we are saying is we are saying that consider a reduction in tension force in reinforcement equal to the force generated by triangular distribution of tensile stress in concrete let's say this is your triangular stress and what is the condition that we have said at this level i need to make sure that i am going to take 0.55 megapascal right so that is what we are saying okay so now what would be this force let's say this is cx means this is going to be what is the distance it's going to be this distance the entire area is going to be capital d minus x right because this is x right so what would be the area uh half into b for rectangular section d minus 6 is the depth and it is a triangular variation so if fcts is what i am taking it as some value 0.5 let's keep that as fct so this would be the triangular distribution of force that is generated by tensile stress in the concrete in the uncracked portion so i am limiting that stress also so the code is saying that you limit it okay you cannot say that uh, you can take the modulus of rupture so code is giving you some limited value because the epsilon 2 you subtract it by some amount okay so then that should be equal to force produced in the steel at that location which is epsilon 2 multiplied by es will give me the stress stress multiplied by ast which is the is going to give me force so this is an average force in the steel that is produced in the uncracked location by assuming 0.55 megapascal of stress okay so when you equate that you can find an expression for your epsilon 2 like this okay and then uh, again this is we are equating now i am calculating let's say depending upon where i am calculating 
P1 or P2, right? Or somewhere here P3, right? These are the points that we did. Okay, P2, P3. Okay, and then you extrapolate this to this. Okay, right? So this is the extrapolation that we do. Okay, so it's a very simple thing. So how do what do we do? We are considering a reduction in tension force in the reinforcement equal to the force generated by triangular distribution of tensile stress in the concrete. Where the FCT is used, tens tensile stress in concrete that is limited to 0.55 as per the as per your bridge score. Okay, that's what IS code has adopted. Now, in fact, what they did in that roundup, in fact, they did not consider 0.55. They actually considered 0.67. So let's look at now. This is relating to the concrete stress at the level of crack location. Now, when you do that, basically, if you look at it, if I put this FCTS as let's say 0.67, okay, 0.67. When you divide by two, it will become 0.33, right? Now, 0.33 is nothing but one third, right? So this half FCTS can be considered as one third, okay? So if I replace this as one third megapascal. Or one by three megapascal. This is a new unit, okay? Because the stress, they are limiting. So then this equation becomes B by three times D minus by E S A S T times A prime minus X by D minus X. So this one third is nothing but the stress in megapascal instead of 0.55 that is specified by the I S code. In our calculations to give, come up with a round value, okay? Code has taken Slightly a higher value of 0.67 because this is also going to be conservative. Because if I am uh, uh, esti higher estimating your mean strain, then my estimation in your crack width is also going to be higher. So it is a reasonable assumption. Instead of dealing with decimals, the code is saying that okay, I have rounded this off to one third megapascal after this simplification, right? So in this way, I can calculate my epsilon two. Now, what is epsilon m? Epsilon m is epsilon one minus epsilon two. Epsilon one is strain from cracked section analysis. Epsilon two is assuming that in the tension side, 0.55 megapascal of force will be uh, stress will be offered by concrete in tension. Using that, we converted them into equivalent strain at the level of steel, which is epsilon two. That you subtract it, you get the mean. Tensile strain. So then, once you get the mean tensile strain (ACR), then you can plug it into the equation. You can find your crack width. So that is the idea. Now there is also one more approach, which is called Gergely-Lutz uh, formula from ACI. Okay, this is an American researcher. He has done a lot of testing, and he came up with some semi-empirical formulation for your crack width. Again, the concept is same. You have to uh, come up with some kind of a, a mean strain, which is your epsilon m. Okay, uh, again same. You consider epsilon one in the crack section, and then but crack section strain will be higher. So I need to reduce it by some magnitude. Uh, that that leads to epsilon m. Now instead of this, then what he did is he said, okay, uh, I'm going to take an effective area which is contributing in tension. So that means what he's saying is, okay, let's say you have group of bars like this. Okay, what is shown here? Then I find for group of bars where is the CG, and then I calculate my effective depth for all the bars. Okay, so this is your effective depth, right? Now he's saying that okay, my effective region where the concrete is going to uh, reduce the strain, the means uh, that reduce the strain in the steel is, I'm going to take that as uh, d minus d above the uh, effective depth location, which is this. So he is saying that okay, I take this region d minus d. This region is equal to d minus d. So that is the region that is where the concrete is very effectively restraining that crack. So that is the shaded area. Okay. Then rest of the things remain same. So he is saying that he is fixing some value for your okay. This is your WCR. Okay. The WCR crack width, and this is some measure of strain, and this is extrapolation to the point where you are considering. And this is FST is the stress in the steel from a crack section analysis that is being divided by some kind of a composite area. So in fact, if you see that cube root is an uh, empirical equation calibrated from several test data. So this is one way of calculating the crack width. Again, so this is 
uh, stress again some mean strain multiplied by your acr acr is taken like this in an average sense now what all the parameters here dc is your thickness of the concrete cover measured from extreme tension fiber to the uh, center of the nearest bar and a is the effective area of concrete in tension surrounding the main reinforcement okay so this is what we are saying having the same centroid as tension steel a is taken as 2 into d minus d divided multiplied by bw this is the effective area of concrete surrounding the tension steel main steel okay and n is the number of bars in case different diameters are used n shall be taken as the total steel area divided by area of the largest bar diameter so some kind of an average of how many bars are there so that is what we are dividing that here okay is an again uh, empirical equation calibrated from experimental investigation so you can use this also but whatever the code has given is a relatively straightforward approach even here i need to calculate my neutral axis depth okay so and then the stress in the steel okay at the centroid of the tension steel 